I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University and visiting professor at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Together with my colleague, Professor Andrea Robilio at the Catholic University of Leuven, we present to you these fall 2014 lectures on Thomas Aquinas on the Nature and Attainment of Happiness, a course taught at Marquette University and at the Catholic University of Leuven. This is class 13, the last of my lectures. It's on Aquinas on ultimate happiness in the Summa Theologiae, Prima Secundae, questions 4 and 5. Uh, and so it's all in one video, and the video is on the requirements for and the attainment of happiness. So let's proceed. Question 4 is focused on what is required for happiness, and it consists of eight articles. For questions one through three, I start I started with the final article of each, but that doesn't work quite as well in this case. So I'm going to, be, I'm going to begin with the first uh, and proceed in order through to the end. We should <clears throat> we should note, pardon me, we should note uh, the important role of delight in Aquinas's explanation of just what this is. Uh, note that, by the way, the similarity with Aristotle's discussion of pleasure as something consequent upon happiness and not itself the end sought. I want to keep that in mind. Uh, also take note of the restricted sense of comprehension that Aquinas uses, uh, as well as the importance of the notion of rectitude of will here in question four. But let's proceed. Regarding articles, well, I guess I'm still talking about this. Regarding articles five through eight, note that all concern uh, goods needed for the imperfect happiness of human life on earth, but are not needed for the perfect happiness found in the vision of God. So, that said, let's proceed with Article 1, whether delight is required for happiness. Aquinas first distinguishes four senses in which something may be necessary. He says it could be as a preamble or preparation, as perfecting something, as helping it from without, or as something attendant upon it. These are th th four ways that something can be deemed necessary. Delight is necessary for Aquinas as something attendant on or consequent upon the attainment of happiness. Put another way, we must do the operation or activity of happiness, namely intellectual vision of God, and then as a consequence of the activity, the delight, which is the, a fulfillment of the appetite, movement, and desire of will, now no longer restless but motionless, comes subsequently. Okay, so the light comes subsequently because it has to do with the fulfillment of the will. As Aquinas says in response to objection two, quote, the very sight of God causes delight. Consequently, he who sees God cannot need delight. Close quote. Of course, this is because the sight of God is the ultimate fulfillment in happiness. So it causes delight, but you've already had complete fulfillment. Note here how he draws on Aristotle in response to the third objection as well. Delight, which in Aristotle's ad account of uh, imperfect happiness in this life, uh, delight is pleasure there. Uh, delight can be a distraction, but in reality it is not the end and fulfillment that happiness is. So as with Aristotle, pleasure can be a distraction. It can, bring a, it can entice us into the wrong sorts of things. And so it, it is not the object sought, namely pleasure. And here the object sought is not delight either, but the object sought is the ultimate fulfillment in happiness. And delight comes as a consequence of that ultimate fulfillment and happiness in seeing the essence of God. Article 2. Whether in happiness vision ranks before delight? And the answer is yes. Uh, here, Aquinas expands on what was implicit in the previous article and more explicitly draws on Aristotle's discussion of pleasure to explain his own doctrine regarding delight. He explains that, quote, delight consists in a certain repose of the will. So that's essentially what delight is. It's going to be the repose of the will. We're no longer frenetically searching for something, uh, but rather we found it, and, and it's, the will is reposed, and... Uh, and uh, enjoying the delight uh, that uh, what has been sought after has been attained. And as already indicated then, the operation of the highest, of highest intellectual apprehension of God is the good, uh, at, uh, as the good, is the fulfillment of the will in every way. So Aquinas, Aquinas then writes, quote, 
Consequently, it's evident that the operation in which the will reposes ranks before the resting of the will therein. Okay, so the, uh, the operation itself comes prior to the resting of the will. It's because of the attainment of the operation that the will can rest. So it's the, the uh, delight or the resting of the will is uh, properly posterior. Uh, the response to objection one follows Aristotle yet again. He, Aquinas writes, delight is a perfection attendant upon vision, but not a perfection whereby vision is made perfect in its own species. Close quote. So delight is something more, it's not vision, but it's attendant upon vision. The response to objection two reminds us that only intellect apprehends the universal good, so it is directed to its fulfilling operation not something consequent to the operation. The senses seek delight in things of the world and do not apprehend the universal good, but only particular goods. <clears throat> but we want to apprehend the universal good, and that happens through intellect. The response to objection three brings in the notion of charity, caritas, or love. And there Aquinas writes, delight does not answer to charity as its end, but vision does whereby the end is first made present to charity. So in that the fulfillment there in love is to be found in the vision. Article 3, whether comprehension is necessary for happiness. Well, of course, Aquinas is going to say that we can't comprehend the essence of God as such, but within the limits of our own abilities as finite entities, we can have a kind of comprehension. We need to identify what must be set in order for the end of happiness. In the case of our intellect, we need to have the end pre-exist in the intellect, however imperfectly that may be, so that we know what we seek. In the case of the will, and now you should recall our discussions of Aristotle and Nicomachean Ethics 9.8 on self-love. So in the case of the will, there must be a first movement towards something and a relation of lover to the beloved. So there's an affective moment here. Aquinas then writes that this is threefold. Quote, For some th sometimes uh, the thing beloved is present to the lover, and then it is no longer sought for. Sometimes it is present. It is not present, and it is impossible to attain. And then, too, it is, not, it is not sought for. But sometimes it is possible to attain it, yet it is raised above the capability of the attainer, so that he cannot have it forthwith. And this is the relation of one that hopes to that which he hopes for. And this relation alone causes a search for the end. To these three, there are corresponding three in happiness itself. The perfect knowledge of the end corresponds to imperfect knowledge. The presence of the end corresponds to the relationship of hope. But delight in the end, now present, results from love, as already stated. And therefore, these three must occur with happiness. To wit, vision, which is perfect knowledge of the intelligible end. Comprehension, which implies the presence of the end the presence of it, not the full sense of comprehension, as if we could comprehend the entire essence of God, but uh, comprehension which implies the presence of the end to the one who, who knows, and delight or enjoyment which implies the repose of the lover in the object beloved. Note the explanation of comprehension, that is, I indicated earlier in response to object, object, uh, objection one, quote, comprehension is twofold, First, inclusion of the comprehended in the comprehensor, and thus whatever is comprehended by the finite is itself finite. Wherefore, God cannot be thus comprehended by a created intellect, because we're finite. Secondly, comprehension means nothing but the, un but the holding of something already present and possessed. Thus, one, runs after an one who runs after another is said to comprehend. And our translators say, in English, we should say catch. So comprehend him when he lays hold of him. He grasps, he puts his arms around him, so he has him in his grasp. That's the sense. 
And in this sense, comprehension is necessary for happiness. So we must have the presence of happiness immediately to us. So comprehension here and in the responses to objections two and three refers to the human intellectual, the finite, grasp of the object of happiness, namely God. Article four, whether the rectitude of the will is necessary for happiness. Well, rectitude of the will involves a firm ascent to the last end, something required for both, for both before the attainment of happiness and in the attainment and possession of happiness as an operation of intellect in the apprehension of God in vision. He writes, quote, Final happiness consists in the vision of the divine essence, which is the very essence of goodness, so that the will of him who sees the essence of God of necessity loves, whatever he loves, in subordination to God, just as the will of him who, who sees not God's essence of necessity loves whatever he loves, under the common notion of good which he knows. And this is precisely what makes the will right. Wherefore, it is evident that happiness cannot be without a right will. Close quote. Article 5, whether the body is necessary for man's happiness. For imperfect, for imperfect happiness in this life, the answer is yes. It is necessary since humans develop intellect through the use of senses for the sake of intellect in use in practical and theoretical matters. So in this life, in this imperfect li in this life of, of imperfect happiness, the answer is yes, the body is necessary. But Aquinas goes on, quote, but as to perfect happiness, which consists in the vision of God, some have maintained that it is not possible to the soul separated from the body. And we have said that souls of saints, when separated from their bodies, do not attain to that happiness until the day of judgment, when they will receive their bodies back again. And this is shown to be false, both by authority and by reason, writes Aquinas. By authority, since the apostle says in, in 2 Corinthians, while we are in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And he points out the reason for this abs of this absence, saying, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Continuing the quotation, though, from Aquinas, Now, from this it is clear that so long as we walk by faith and not by sight, bereft of the vision of the divine essence, we are not present to the Lord. And he had said something earlier about this with regard to the, to the weakness of faith in comprehending God. He goes on here then, But the souls of the saints separated from their bodies are in God's presence. Wherefore, the text continues, quote, but we are confident and have a good will to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Close quote. Whence, writes Aquinas, it is evident that the souls of the saints separated from their bodies, quote, walk by sight, unquote, seeing the essence of God, wherein is true happiness. And of course, the reasoning is that the activity is the activity of seeing God is an intellectual activity, and the soul separate from the body has this intellectual activity, and so it walks by sight or it is seeing the essence of God, namely intellectually apprehending the essence of God, because the soul has all that it needs to do this kind of thing. It does not need the body to do this. In fact, the intellectual apprehension of God can only be by intellect and not by body. He also writes the following, uh, then, uh, again, this is made clear by reason, for the intellect needs not the body for its operation, save on account of the phantasms wherein it looks on the intelligible truth, as stated in the first part. Now it is evident that the divine essence cannot be seen by means of phantasms, as was stated in the first part. Wherefore, since man's perfect happiness consists in the vision of the divine essence, it does not depend on the body. Consequently, without the body, the soul can be happy. Quote. And note that he goes on in the rest of the response to indicate the need for the body for the well-being of the human being. But it's the well-being of the human being in the present life, in this life of imperfect happiness that his main focus is on here. 
Uh, notice that the responses to the objections make it clear that the soul can attain happiness and fulfillment in the absence of the body, which perhaps raises again the question for us of whether the body really is necessary for the afterlife. In his response to objection five, Aquinas writes the following, which is directly relevant to this issue, because the question is, do we need the body in the afterlife for any reason whatsoever? Because we already have complete happiness with the separated soul intellectually apprehending the object of ultimate happiness, namely divine essence. So here Aquinas writes in objection five, in response to objection five, quote, the desire of the separated soul is entirely at rest as regards the thing desired. That's it. The separated soul is entirely at rest with regard to what is desired when it's attaining happiness. Since to it, it has that which suffices its appetite, and nothing can suffice for the fulfillment of the appetite more than the apprehension of the essence of God. Aquinas then writes, but it is not wholly at rest as regards the desirer, since it does not possess that good in every way that it would wish to possess it. His point is, given that we are naturally entities consisting of body and soul, body can be brought into this. Consequently, he writes, after the body has been resumed, happiness increases, not in intensity, but in extent. So now the appreciation of being in the presence of God can be felt in the body, apparently. But it does not increase happiness in intensity because it always has, already the soul already has complete happiness. <clears throat> Article 6 is on whether perfection of the body is necessary for happiness. Simply put, yes, with regard to imperfect happiness of earthly life. Yet it is different for perfect happiness, of course, from what we already saw, you know that's the case. Quote, but speaking of perfect happiness, some have maintained that no disposition of body is necessary for happiness. Indeed, that it is necessary for the soul to be entirely separated from the body. Hence, Augustine in De Civitate Dei quotes the words of Porphyry, who said that, quote, for the soul to be happy, it must be severed from everything corporeal, close quote. Truly a Neoplatonic statement, that's for sure. But this is unreasonable, writes Aquinas, for since it is natural to the soul to be united to the body, it is not possible for the perfection of the soul to exclude its natural perfection. So it has to be included somehow. He continues in the quotation, Consequently, we must say that the perfect disposition of the body is necessary both antecedently and consequently, for the happiness which is in all ways perfect. Antecedently, because as Augustine says, if body be such that the governance thereof is difficult and burdensome, like unto flesh which is corruptible and weighs upon the soul, the mind is turned away from the vision of the highest heaven. Close quote. Whence, writes Aquinas, uh, Augustine concludes that, quote, when this body will no longer be natural but spiritual, then it will be equal to the angels and that will be its glory, which erstwhile was its burden. Close quote. And so Aquinas says, consequently, because that, because from the happiness of the soul, there will be an overflow onto the body, so that this will, too will obtain its perfection. Hence, Augustine says that, quote, God gave the soul such a powerful nature that from its exceeding fullness of happiness, the vigor of incorruption flows into the lower nature. So there's a kind of, in, in the apprehension of happiness, a kind of overflowing into the nature of the body as well, because the whole human being is body and soul together. Article 7 of Question 4. Whether any external goods are necessary for happiness? All for imperfect happiness on earth, yet again, yes. For ultimate happiness in the vision of God, no. That was simple. Article 8. Whether the fellowship of friend is necessary for happiness? Again, for imperfect happiness on earth, yes. For ultimate happiness in the vision of God, no. How could more than perfect happiness in knowing God require more? It is not necessary as such. But if you look carefully, Aquinas does say that it, having friends and uh, the social context does enhance 
uh, enhance our lives uh, both in uh, both in imperfect happiness and in perfect happiness. But I'll leave that for you to read. Now we're in question five of the attainment of happiness, which has eight articles. I'm going to proceed through uh, through them in their written order, through them in their written order, highlighting key notions and issues. You'll note, however, that much follows simply from what's already been established. So, Article 1, whether man can attain happiness. Simply put, yes, through the intellect. And he writes, quote, The rational exceeds the sensitive nature, otherwise than the intellectual surpasses the rational. For the rational exceeds the sensitive nature in respect of the object of its knowledge. Since the senses have no knowledge whatever of the universal, whereas reason has knowledge thereof. And he continues. But the intellectual surpasses the rational nature as to the mode of knowing the same intelligible truth. For the intellectual nature grasps, grasps forthwith the truth which the rational nature reaches by inquiry of reason, as was made clear in the first part. So intellect immediately grasps. Reason goes step by step. Therefore, reason arrives by a kind of movement, see, step by step, by a movement uh, at that which the intellect grasps. Consequently, the rational nature can attain happiness, which is the perfection of the intellectual nature, so the rational human being can attain it, but otherwise than angels. Why? Because it's, angels receive it in a different way. He says, because the angels attained it forthwith after the beginning of their creation, whereas man attains it after a time. But the sensitive nature can nowise attain this end. Close quote. Article 2. Whether one man can be happier than another? Yes. Quote, As stated above, happiness implies two things, to wit, the last end itself, that is the sovereign good, or God, and the attainment or enjoyment of that same good. As to the good itself, which is the object and cause of happiness, one happiness cannot be greater than another, since there is but one supreme good, namely God, by enjoying whom men are made happy. But as to the attainment or enjoyment of this good, one man can be happier than another, because the more a man enjoys this good, the happier he is. Now that one man enjoys good more than another happens through his being better disposed or ordered to the enjoyment of him. And in this sense, one man can be happier than another. So perhaps there are a better moral character to be, to be disposed toward God. Article 3. Whether one can be happy in this life? Answer, yes, but not perfectly. Quote, first from the general notion of happiness. For since happiness is a perfect and sufficient good, it excludes every evil and fulfills every desire. But in this life, every evil can be excluded. No, I mean, pardon me, but in this life, every evil cannot be excluded. For this present life is subject to many unavoidable evils, to ignorance on the part of the intellect, to inordinate affection on the part of the appetite, and to many penalties on the part of the body. As Augustine sets forth in City of God, as Augustine puts sets forth in the City of God, likewise, neither can the desire for good be satiated in this life. For man naturally desires the good, which he has to be abiding. We expect it to naturally have a desire for the good. We expect it to be with us forever. Now the goods of the present life pass away. Since life itself passes away, which we naturally desire to have and would wish to hold abidingly, that is forever, for man naturally shrinks from death. Wherefore, it is impossible to have true happiness in this life. And we continue. Secondly, from a consideration of the specific nature of happiness, namely the vision of the divine essence, which man cannot obtain in this life, as was shown in the first part. Hence it's evident that none can attain true and perfect happiness in this life. So that seems to be clear enough. 
Uh, note the response to objection two. Happiness is imperfect if it is not had in the ultimate object, God. Period. So it's imperfect if it's not had in the ultimate object. And all human happiness is imperfect when it's compared with that of God himself. God's happiness much transcends. It is perfect happiness, and ours is imperfect in relation to God's. Article 4. Whether happiness at once had can be lost. Here Aquinas responds to Origen on the idea that perfect happiness can be lost. And I'll leave that to you to look at in detail. For Aquinas, though once seen, the divine essence is known as ultimate happiness and can never be willed against. That's analytic, because it's the ultimate good. And we can't will it. Once we've seen the ultimate complete happiness and, and possessed it, hold, held it, as it were, then we, we can't will against it. It's in the very meaning of the terms. One cannot lose it by one's own accord, and there's no agent that can take it away once it's had. So the answer, no. Happiness cannot be lost once it's had. Article 5, whether man can attain happiness by his natural powers. Well, sure. That's, of course, not a problem. But that's with regard to imperfect happiness, not perfect happiness. Perfect happiness very much is, uh, cannot be attained by natural powers. Of course not. Quote, imperfect happiness can be had in this life, can be acquired by man by his natural powers, in the same way as virtue, in whose operation it consists. On this point, we shall speak further on question 63. But man's perfect happiness, as stated above, consists in the vision of the divine essence. Now, the division of the divine essence surpasses the nature not only of man, but also of every creature, as is shown in the first part. For the natural knowledge of every creature is in keeping with the mode of his substance, thus it is said of the intelligence in the decausis, that it knows things above it, and it knows the things that are below it, according to the mode of its substance. And he continues, But every knowledge that is according to the mode of created substance falls short of the vision of the divine essence, which infinitely surpasses all created substance. Consequently, neither man nor any creature can attain final happiness by his natural powers. And then note also, so this is all flowing very nicely from what's already been established, and it's really quite clear. The note, and note the response to objection one. This is quite valuable. He says there, quote, Just as nature does not fail man in things that are necessary, necessary as he puts, although it has not provided him with weapons and clothing, it has provided it is as it is provided other animals, because it gives the human being reason and hands with which he's able to get these things for himself. So neither did it fail man in, in things necessary, although it gave him not the wherewithal to attain happiness. Since this it could not do. But it did give human beings, give him free will, with which he can turn to God, that he may make that God may make him happy. Quote, for what we do by means of our friends is done in a sense by ourselves. Close quote. And that's from Nicomachean Ethics. Question six whether man attains happiness through the action of some higher creature. Well, angels and others can be helpful in guiding human beings toward happiness. But quote, but by God alone is man made happy if we speak of perfect happiness. If, however, we speak of imperfect happiness, the same is to be said of it as a virtue in whose act it consists. And next, question seven. Whether any good works are necessary that man may receive happiness from God? Well, none can necessitate it, but yes, they can help in the formation of human character. Aquinas writes the following, and character, of course, is relevant to moral status. Aquinas writes this, quote, Rectitude of the will, as stated above, is necessary for happiness, since it is nothing else than the right order of the will to the last end. That's required for happiness. And it is therefore necessary for obtaining the end, 
just as the right disposition of matter in order to receive the form. But this does not prove that any work of man need precede his happiness, for God could make a will having a right tendency to the end, and at the same time attaining the end. Just as sometimes he disposes matter, and at the same time introduces the form. But the order of divine wisdom demands that it should not be this way. As stated in the De Celo of Aristotle, quote, of those things that have a natural capacity for the perfect good, one has it without movement, some by one movement, some by several. And the quotation continues. Now to possess the perfect good without movement belongs to that which has it naturally. And to have happiness naturally belongs to God alone. So God has complete and perfect happiness and infinite happiness in virtue of himself. Therefore, he, the quotation continues, therefore it belongs to God alone not to be moved toward happiness by any previous operation. Now since happiness surpasses every created nature, no pure creature can becomingly gain happiness without the movement of operation whereby it tends thereto. But the angel who is above man in the natural order obtained it according to the order of divine wisdom by one movement of a meritorious work, as was explained in the first part. Whereas man obtains it by many movements of works which are called merits. Wherefore, also according to the philosopher, happiness is the reward of works of virtue. Close quote. So moral virtue will be rewarded with happiness. And so those works are helpful. <clears throat> Article 8. Whether every man desires happiness. Well, simply yes, of course. That's from the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics. Yes. But humans can, confuse, can be confused about the choice of immediate ends toward ultimate happiness. And humans can go astray by weakness of will and pursuit of the fulfillment of desires as particular goods. Losing track of the universal good and losing track of what is the perfect good happiness and goodness. Quote, happiness can be considered in two ways, writes Aquinas. First, according to the general notion of happiness, and thus, of necessity, every man desires happiness. For the general notion of happiness consists in the perfect good, as stated above. But since good is the object of the will, the perfect good of man is that which entirely satisfies his will. Consequently, to desire happiness is nothing else than to desire that one's will be satisfied. And this everyone desires. And to continue the quotation. Secondly, we may speak of happiness according to its specific notion, as to that in which it consists. And thus all do not know happiness, because they do not they know not in what thing the general notion of happiness is found. And consequently, in this respect, not all desire it, because they can't find it. Wherefore, the reply to the first objection is clear. So that's that's a quick review of uh, questions four and five. Uh, as I read this, most of it follows from what has happened earlier, and he makes some clarifications, but the reasoning seems to be strong. And I think in accord with our last class discussion, <clears throat> the arguments here, are for the most part philosophical, but it's legitimate to use philosophical arguments about the nature of reality, certainly legitimate to use that in, uh, in our discussions of theological matters. And of course, the Summa Theologiae is a theological work. So the arguments are philosophical, they find their use here in theology. But as we discussed in class, while it's legitimate for, for theology to make use of facts of the world and things known through philosophy and science, it's not legitimate for philosophy, which purports to be natural knowing, to make use of things that are supernatural and pertain to theology. And with those words, this is the end of the lectures for the class, and uh, uh, this completes the lectures for our class on the nature and attainment of happiness in Thomas Aquinas. And I look forward to the classroom discussions, and also the classroom discussion with Professor Steele on the 4th of December. Thank you.